Hello. All right, we're good to go. Um, I'm Richard Bradley, Midlands Connect, and I'm your chair for this panel session on measuring and delivering the decarbonisation of transport. Uh, this session is about sharing the great work and successes of the subnational transport bodies. Um, we're using Slido, as you uh, heard earlier if you were in the earlier sessions, to gather your questions from the audience. Uh, I recommend that you download the Slido app if you've not already done that. And, um, and run things through the app. You, the code on the sign there is wrong. It's actually STBC23. And if, if you do submit a question, it'd be great to know who you are, if you could put your name on. Um, this panel session will discuss how the subnational transport bodies are collaborating both across regions and within regions to decarbonize the transport system. The panelists will discuss how STBs are measuring the scale of the carbon emissions through carbon reporting tools, how they are supporting local transport authorities in choosing the right policies in the right locations. The panelists will discuss the wider carbon reductions needed within the transport system and how important the circular economy will become. They'll talk about some of the emerging mobility options that will help reduce carbon emissions and they'll end by considering what else is needed to change people's attitudes and behaviours in meeting our net zero commitments. I'll now invite each panellist to provide key discussion points on their theme within this subject. Please send questions via Slido. And Rennie, who's at the back, hello Rennie. Rennie's uh, going to be logging those in and, and moderating. And hopefully, if we've got time at the end, we'll be able to have some questions then. Um, if we don't get back to anybody's answers, please keep them coming because we'll see what we can do after the event as well. Okay, so our first panellist is Swati Mittel, who is the Roads and Decarb Lead at Midlands Connect. Swati has a strong background in evolving the function and hierarchy of the road network and managing the balance of traveller needs with reducing climate impacts within a more integrated system. Um, Swati, if we can't measure it, we can't manage it. How can we best measure the scale of transport carbon emissions across the regions and use that to focus our efforts? Thanks, Richard. Um, so, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm Swati Mittal. I look after the road program and decarbonization initiatives at Midlands Connect. And to answer your question, Richard, and like you said, if we can't measure it, we can't manage it. And, and, and with that purpose, I mean, the way us STBs, where we can add real value is to empower our local authority partners, as well as for us to understand what are the scales of carbon emissions? Where are they coming from? What is the nature of carbon emission within the region? You know, what is the problem that a local authority can tackle on them, their, their own and where, where do we need collaboration? So with, with that objective, we have developed a tool that uh, we call as carbon baseline tool. Uh, it is a very transparent, publicly owned, spreadsheet-based tool that allows our local authority partners and us to understand like, you know, where the carbon emissions are coming from. It slices and dices the emission by journey purposes, trip lengths, uh, time of the day, um, by road type, you know, by origin and destination of the trip. It basically um, simplifies the way in which you can look at the carbon emission and understand it better. Um, so it came up with really interesting facts that, 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 that we weren't even aware of before we were developing that tool. Like, you know, 70% of the carbon emission is more strategic in nature. It is not within the control of a single local authority. It requires collaboration to be able to tackle that problem. You know, um, the uh, problems in rural, rural area and the nature of emission in rural area is different from urban areas. Uh, rural trips are bigger emitters or, or, or major contributors to the carbon emissions because of high car dependency, longer trip lengths, and again, you know, uh, trips crossing different uh, boundaries. Freight is another uh, issue in Midlands. Uh, it, is, it is because Midlands is like a very freight heavy um, uh, area because majority of the freight 
has to pass through Midlands. You can't avoid us. Even if you do not originate or, or terminate here, you, you are passing through us. So 27% of our freight emission comes from the strategic trips. And you know, around 70% of the freight emissions crosses boundaries. So that, that's why we are, we are working in collaboration with other STBs to be able to measure those kind of carbon emissions, uh, uh, nature and uh, you know, scale of these emissions. And so that we can understand where we can add best value uh, how we can come up with the solutions or where, where we can gather more evidence, develop tools or, or, or like support for our local authority partners to be able to manage those problems. And, and this study has then resulted in some of the studies, further studies that we have undertaken, like, you know, um, the alternative fuel studies for the freight vehicles so that we can uh, encourage the the shift of freight vehicles to more energy efficient, uh, uh, carbon efficient fuels. We have also uh, we are also looking into developing a tool, which is like our EV uh, charging tool, which uh, again um, allows our local authority partners to understand where the charging point needs are uh, for the electric vehicles, and 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 so that we can encourage the shift to more electric um, uh, vehicles and and decarbonized uh, ways of traveling. So, um, so this is this is how we think measuring it and understanding it better can add more value, Richard. Thank you. Thank you, Swati. Um, it's such a big subject area. Yeah. It's been really important that we focus in on particular priorities, and the collaboration can hopefully pick up those some of those specialties. Uh, before we move on to the next panelist, uh, I just have a quick question, Swati. Um, we're expecting the local and regional baselines to rapidly change. Uh, what do you think are the key challenges in keeping the baseline relevant? And how can you best share, how can we best share this information with the local authorities uh, and make it more relevant and useful for them? Right, so, so um, to keep up with the changing, uh, uh, rapidly changing baseline, First of all, I think uh, the most important thing is collaboration, working with other STBs and DFT so that we can make use of the latest best, best value data and incorporate it in any of the tools that we develop. Also automation so that the tools are automated enough to be able to uh, you know, uh, up to respond to these changing baseline, plus providing and building flexibility in those tools so that um, uh, local authorities can incorporate their own baselines. Say, for example, if someone, uh, if, if there's an authority whose policies support uh, more, uh, you know, aggressive, rapid EV intake, they should be able to feed it back to the baseline. So it's not just working through the top-down approach, but like, you know, working top-down and bottom-up so that we continually update that tool from the information that we gather from the local areas as well as from the, uh, you know, national uh, area. So it's just integrating the two together. Thank you, Swati. So a lot about sharing, sharing the data effort, those data pipelines, making sure they're well-maintained. Again, that collaboration piece, I think we're going to hear that all through the day. And then tools that our partners can use and becomes important. Okay, thank you, Swati. Uh, our second panellist is James Golden Graham, who is the decarbonisation and innovation lead at England's Economic Heartland. Uh, James has experience in numerous policy areas and specialises in delivering multiple work streams uh, within the overall theme of sustainability. Uh, James, uh, with so many work streams now focused on sustainability, how can we plan policies consistently across regions and use all our powers to tackle carbon emissions? Uh, thanks, Richard. I think, yeah, consistency and collaboration, key words there. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that the STBs are collectively doing to understand and quantify the impacts of policies on transport carbon emissions in different types of places. Um, you'll remember back when the Transport Decarbonisation Plan was published, there was an explicit ask in there for the LTAs to provide data on carbon emissions in their parts of the world. So Swati's talked a little bit about that work that Midlands Connect are doing, and that's now being replicated across all of the STBs. So we're all developing a carbon baseline which our local authorities will have access to. The other thing that the TDP was clear that they uh, wanted and expected local authorities to do was to actually quantify the impacts of the interventions that they were planning to produce within their local transport plans. And this is the big piece of work that we've collaboratively been working on across the STBs for probably about 12 months or so now. Um, so to understand those kind of... I think it was really important because we knew that, you know, from, from a starting position, the impact of a cycle lane in 
I don't know, deepest Cumbria in, in, the, in, the, in the rural wilds would be very different than it would be in, in central Bir Birmingham. So we need to understand how those policy implications, what those policy impacts would be in different places, different place types. Um, it's also really important that our local authorities use the same metrics, use the same underpinning data. Um, we felt that was going to be really important and un to understand those differences, really important, particularly as was initially kind of outlined in the uh, transport decarbonisation plan that some future funding decisions might be made on the, uh, on, on the allocation, funding allocations were going to be made to the ambition commitments written into the LCP. Now, I think DFT have probably moved away a little bit from that in the short term, but you know, it, the point stands that if we have, if we're talking about understanding the impacts of things in different places, a common metric would be really, really important to understand that. We're also mindful with support from DFT that if we develop these tools and matrices collective, matrix collectively, there'd be a real significant benefit to doing that in terms of cost, but in terms of also not ending up with competing methodologies, which we've seen in the past. Uh, you know, some of you will have been around when the uh, so, so early, earlier funding rounds around active travel, for example, where different people came up with different impacts for cycle lanes in kind of quite same, similar places. I think that really shows a lot of the value that STBs can bring to the table here in terms of making sure that we have some consistency there. So anyway, going back, the ultimate goal was to provide this tool that uh, merges the individual LTA baselines um, and, and this kind of really nice user-friendly interface, a tool which would give uh, local authorities an idea of, okay, if I deploy intervention X, Y, and Z, what does that do for the carbon emissions in my specific place? Now, there were some really, really complex processes to go through here. Um, not an easy, not an easy uh, program, I'd say. And I think many of the uh, consultancies and, uh, and, and the DFT colleagues are in the room who helped us to do that and supported that. Um, but it's, it's a tricky thing to do. The first thing we had to do was come up with common standardization of place and place typology. We've come up with seven, I think, which are now agreed. Uh, and we're mapping them across the whole of the English geography so we can start to uh, share our work better by kind of making sure we're using consistency of place types. And then to understand the effects of these different policies in those different place types, the consultants went through this really extensive desktop review of I think it was hundreds and hundreds of reports and documents, and it came quite clear to us that there wasn't really a lot of consistency in terms of the quality of those, of those evidence uh, sources. So uh, we, we've had to go through this process of using uh, some additional modeling. We've used uh, some mode choice modeling based on NTS data to fill the gaps. So combining that with that observed evidence, we've now got evidence for about 30 different interventions in those seven different place types. So a really, a really complex kind of approach to that piece of work, but really, really valuable, I think, for giving uh, local authorities that, that kind of solid information uh, to, to start planning their policy out. And as I say, we've had DFT involved in the room with us from day one on that one, so thank you to DFT for that. Um, so combining that with some basic information from a transport model, uh, we can kind of give those local authorities this tool. So we're now taking that and combining that into an online tool, which is the next step to this. And we're still in the process of, of finalizing some of the uh, little kind of granular bits of functionalities into that. Uh, but we should have the first iteration of that ready for testing sometime in July, uh, hopefully being published in August. Uh, this is the three STBs in the southeast, enabling the other STBs to collectively join in and plug their baselines into that tool, uh, hopefully in line with the uh, publication of the LTP, uh, the LTP update. Um, it, as I say, not been an easy process, but I think um, working across the STBs, we're building something really new. It's not going to be perfect. We will iterate on this. We'll continue to support it. And um, I've probably been well over time there, so I'll stop. Well, you've mentioned the word consistency yes. uh, many times there, James. Uh, consistency, replicating a common baseline, which Swati talked about. And I suppose, in a way, that, that bottom-up building of the evidence mm. so that the, not only is it consistent in the region, it's consistent across the seven regions so we can take it back to government and present a more consistent picture with those consistent metrics. Um, <coughs> I, I really hope this is going to give us a level playing field or at least a minimum standard of a level playing field yeah. for people to work to. Um, before we go to the next panellist, uh, I have a question. Um, you've talked about the decarbonisation policy playbook there uh, as an online ready reckoner to help steer the aspirations set out in the local transport plans. Uh, 
But this is urgent. Climate change is, requires urgent action. What can we do to accelerate the policies into schemes uh, that we need for that reduced carbon emissions? Well, I'll do a little bit of a plug for the session I'm chairing in a minute, which is about the common analytical framework. So a few, it's been mentioned once or twice. So come along to that, and I'll tell you. But no, uh, outside, of, outside of that, I think, and I'm always going to say it, but more explicit and uh, consistent policy kind of signals from government is always going to be useful. You've seen fairly, fairly significant changes in focus. And, you know, we, we, we've talked about the fact the last two or three years have been a little bit crazy. But um, consistency of focus from government. But if that doesn't come, then I think the STBs, again, have a role to play in providing a consistent evidence base. If we give people really, really good evidence that we're going to keep up to date, we're going to keep robust, uh, we should be able to support their accelerated policy development and deployment. Okay, thank you, James. Thank you. Uh, we'll now move on to our third panellist, Claire Oleran Shaw, uh, Associate Director at XLR. Uh, Claire has more than 20 years' experience in sustainability for both private and public sectors. Claire's well known in the West Midlands for circular economy low-carbon solutions and understanding the supply chain. Uh, Claire is the chair of the West Midlands Innovation uh, Alliance's working group on innovative zero-carbon approaches. Claire, it's not just about emissions. How do we take a 360-degree view of the whole carbon life cycle? <clears throat> Thanks, Richard. So, yeah, in our journey to decarbonise to net zero, there's a lot of focus on renewable energy and energy efficiency, and rightly so. Um, but actually, these measures only address just over half of the carbon emissions that we create, and the other 45% are within the embodied carbon of the infrastructure, buildings, and products, materials we use um, every, in everyday life. An organisation called the Ellen MacArthur Foundation um, wrote a report called Completing the Picture. Um, we looked at, at five circular economy um, strategies for key uh, materials, um, those being cement, aluminium, steel, plastics, and food. Um, at least uh, two of those very big in the infrastructure sector, cement and steel. Um, and if we could um, put these strategies into place, we could reduce our carbon emissions. There is some numbers, I won't mention those, but that's, it's the equivalent of cutting current, current, current transport emissions um, to zero. Um, I did have a slide, actually, with my little explanation of... Uh, Hey, uh, there we go. There sorry. we go. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, uh, for those of you not familiar with circular economy, this is a, a very simple slide. It's my, my favourite, and thank you to Circular Flanders. This 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 diagram has been used worldwide to explain circular economy. Um, but it looks to reduce material use, circulate the materials that we do use, and to regenerate um, natural systems. Um, and I think this speaks really well to the to the constrained systems that we're that we the in infrastructure and transport sector are working in at the moment, which we spoke um, about spoken speakers spoke about earlier. Um, so this requires a wholesale change to the economy. Um, again, it, it requires a lot of innovation. We've already spoken and heard a lot about the need for innovation. Um, it requires new policies, um, and it requires businesses, new startups, or indeed um, business transition um, to occur to um, ensure um, that this circular economy change um, ha ha can happen. And it, again, speaking to previous um, speakers, trying new things, um, not being um, scared to, um, to, to try new things and fail, and learning from our set success in this space is absolutely critical. But it's not only about meeting our net zero targets, we need to prepare for our already um, changing climate and have an awareness of that um, need for climate resilience. And indeed, we've been doing some work with Midlands Connect um, with our climate resilience um, mapping tool in, in, in that area. Um, so, so we at Accela, um, we're a sustainability strategy company and we've used our experience in circular economy and climate resilience when we led on environment at the um, Transport Infrastructure Efficiency Strategy Living Lab, which was um, funded by DFT and Innovate UK. Um, so the partners Network Rail, um, TFL, HS2, um, National Highways and East West Rail, and all have commitments to circular economy. Um, I help facilitate a circular economy community of practice, and one of the key tasks for that was to um, 
create a shared list of metrics to measure circular economy, which again is not, an, these metrics are quite um, challenging, um, but we, we made a good start on that. But there was a real benefit of the group of um, subject matter experts coming together from across those organizations to share experience and learned, um, learning on joint challenges. Um, one of the key things there was of interest was um, on resource exchange mechanisms. So many of um, these organizations interested in setting up online platforms to allow exchange of excess materials to be advertised within or outside of their own or organization uh, to make those available for reuse. Um, one, another example of, um, that came up through that um, community of practice process was around the reuse of ballast. Um, it's an increasingly expensive commodity, often being sourced overseas these days and used it in large amounts. Uh, it can be reused, and it's being cleaned and reused in many places, but there's space for improvement. Uh, one of the TIES partners um, wanted to carry out more research in this area, and they invited other partners to come on board, saving time, money, carbon, and resources. Um, but in the, in the brave new circular economy world, design is everything, and is the key. Designing buildings and infrastructure where possible that are demountable, having clear records of where materials are located in the building and available through digital twins and material passports, all to enable materials to be kept in use um, for longer. And there's some interesting pilot projects running on this at the moment through EU-funded projects like Circuit Project, so please do have a look at their website to find out more. Actually, um, London is blazing a trail for circular economy policy at the moment through the London plan. Um, this is a policy that requires all um, uh, planning applications referable to the mayor to have a circular economy statement um, that sets out developers' intentions in this space. Um, so this gives developers who are keen on this idea a chance to shine um, and ensures others nudge their practice forward. So overall, Richard, I bet you're glad I'm finishing. Lots of opportunity in every, every sector, including transport, and we really need to grasp the opportunities and turn them up into reality. And there's lots of good pilots out there, but they need to be scaled up. Um, but there's opportunities for unlocking carbon, material, and financial savings. And I think it's a really interesting area for the STBs to, to look yeah, into. Uh, absolutely. So a wholesale change for the economy. In fact, decarbing the UK economy could be the biggest challenge that we face um, with regards to the subnational transport bodies collaborating and trying to figure out those priorities that we talked about when Swati was talking, who does what. And to think 30 years, nearly 30 years ago, we had coal, we only just got the internet. You know, do we think by 2050 uh, things will be as they are now? There's going to be huge amounts of change. And, and we're a drive demand, of course. So um, you, you talked, you obviously talked about the circular economy a lot there. and. Uh, and how we need to reuse, recycle the, the, the six R's. Is it six R's? I think it's six, isn't it? Um, if we can reduce the carbon emissions and do our part to reduce global temperatures, how can we monetize uh, the value that creates? Could this become part of our economic appraisal? Yeah, thanks, Richard. Yeah, I think the, um, there are three types of value that we can identify quite easily. Um, one are direct and immediate savings. Um, so through um, changes in fuel use, through reducing energy use, as I've just talked about, using less materials and producing less waste. We can measure that, and that has a quite direct um, financial um, saving. Um, there are then um, savings that, are, that we can monetize that are direct, but less obvious. And um, really, this is when we think about whole life um, thinking around assets, whole life costing, and whole life carbon um, planning and modeling both cost and carbon across life cycles. That's design, construction, use, end of life, and um, importantly for circular economy, um, beyond the life of a project where you might see uh, materials passed across projects. And this modeling gives us visibility of opportunities and value um, that might not be surfaced if we just looked through the construction phase. So yeah, benefits of circular design, reduced energy use in the operational phase, benefits of modern, modern methods of construction, for example. And tools to help us do this, the newly updated PAS 2080, the carbon infrastructure um, tool, and very much um, 
being described as a partnership tool um, in this new update and encouraging us to challenge and innovate all the time. Um, and the International Cost Management System Standard, ICMS 3, also this version for the first time also considers card carbon against cost to allow that interrelationship um, to be um, explored. And finally, yeah, indirect value. Um, infrastructure projects should include the value of the cost of carbon as set out in the, the TAG um, guidance. But we can get a couple of proxies, um, firstly from um, trading schemes. Um, so the UK emissions trading schemes puts um, price on a ton of um, carbon within the industries that currently are part of that cap and trade market. It's currently £53 um, per tonne. Um, and secondly, through the offsetting market, the offsetting market been in, in the news quite a lot recently, currently varies between about 15 and 70 pounds ton, per tonne of CO2 equivalent. And that kind of gives us a barometer of what businesses are willing to pay uh, for carbon emission um, removal. Um, so yeah, our, our focus should always be on carbon um, reduction with offsetting as a final option. It's better value to reduce carbon than to offset. Um, and legitimate concerns ab about the legitimacy of carbon offsetting and the potential for this carbon trading um, scheme to actually be expanded um, in the future. Um, so it's also worth a moment to reflect on um, carbon within, um, within nature-based solutions, which I know is something that the STBs are also interested in. Um, and the benefits of this, the ONS have got a good um, natural capital accounting system that allows for monetary value to be attributed to the co-benefits of um, natural capital work. Um, so, yeah, there's lots of um, values here, Richard, that we can feed into the, yeah. the, the Treasury's BCR um, work. Um, you told me yourself it tends to focus mainly on costs, so hopefully some of these values could be, could be, fed, could yeah. be fed in. Um, but we all must yeah, keep in mind the huge cost to society of the high carbon emissions. Um, I think that's a, a really good plan. We'll have to yeah. move on. It's, sure. um, keep the carbon in the ground is a message that always rings out in my head. Yeah. Um, our fourth panellist, uh, Matthew Ledbury, is a senior policy and advocacy officer at Como UK. Uh, Matthew, you've got a background in academic academia in environmental change and management and worked for a while as a university researcher on carbon reduction. Um, Matthew became an environmental, uh, environmental uh, policy advisor for the European rail sector in Brussels before subsequently joining Como UK. Um, Matthew, we've talked about carbon emissions and we've talked about policies and how ready we are uh, to enable the shared and... Uh, sorry, how ready are we to enable the shared and new mobility op uh, solutions that we need? Well, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> if you'll forgive me. I think me. we've got some slides as well. Yes, I have, actually. Um, is it possible to bring them up? There we um, go. Yes, do forgive me for this, but um, uh, I know PowerPoints are sort of the, the, um, the useful support that people often have at times like this. Um, the problem tends to be that when you find there's not a lot of power and sometimes not a lot of point either. Um, but hopefully it will be actually useful in supporting what I'm trying to say just briefly, but I will keep them as brief as possible. Um, but just in terms of the introduction, um, quite right, I'm from Como UK, and for those of you who aren't familiar with Como UK, um, Como UK is short for Collaborative Mobility. We're the, the, the national organisation that supports and promotes shared transport. And shared transport is things like car clubs, bike share, uh, DDRT we cover now, e-scooter share, uh, and infrastructure in the form of mobility hubs. Um, what it basically is about is, is a much more e efficient use of um, vehicles and infrastructure. Um, as uh, many of you know, that, that uh, the private car sits there unused for about 95% of the time. It's a really a shocking, inefficient thing that we have. Um, what this is about is the ability to do individual uh, journeys, but without the need to actually own um, the, the, the means of transport that you're using. Now, in terms of the impact of this, I think, if I just go there, with, with Car Club, um, uh, use. Um, one of the figures I was going to pull out there, the one on the right hand side, is that the, the number of private cars that get replaced by each car club, uh, each car club um, vehicle. This is in terms of people actually joining car clubs and the consequences of doing it. It actually reduces 
the, the total number of private vehicles, and we've calculated um, this is on the basis of, a, of an annual um, survey we do, that it works out for about 20 private cars for each car, car colour vehicle we have in the country. So it's not an insignificant number. Um, it also, uh, also has the effect of reducing people's um, overall car mileage by about... Uh, I think 10 to 15 percent um, on average when they join. So in terms of changing behaviour, it's quite significant. If I can bring in um, bike shares, um, the key thing I think I'd, I'd pull out there is probably on the left-hand side. Um, it's the percentage of, of cyclists that would have done the journey previously by car. It's, it's offering people um, the means to travel um, al um, alternatively that when they do it, they will take. And it, and it, is a more um, environmentally, uh, much more obviously environmentally friendly way of doing it. But it offers the ability to do it because it's there without the need to actually own it, um, without the need to have somewhere to, um, to keep it, or, or without the need of it being stolen as well. So these are examples of, of the benefits that can be brought environmentally um, just through having shared transport. In terms of what needs to happen to um, help it develop more, I think there's, there's a couple of things I just want to bring up. First one is this, is local transport plans. Um, uh, as many of you will probably know, we're sitting around waiting for quite a while now um, for the local transport plan guidance, the new local transport plan guidance. Um, and one of the things this is going to include is the technical guidance for quantifiable carbon reductions. Um, this could be quite a game changer in terms of what it, it may, how it means that local authorities are required to calculate and develop their policies. Um, now, from a shared transport point of view, um, it's still very much uh, a hit and miss approach. We have um, some examples of, of um, very good strategies in terms of a shared transport development. Um, on the other extreme, I still come across from time to time some where there is quite literally nothing. Um, so the potential here in terms of trying to um, develop more um, uh, progressive and, and um, uh, sensible strategies that can drive these approaches forward is, is there. And the second thing that is relevant is in, in planning terms. Um, we've, got, we've got the advantage that the, the LERB, the Leveling Up and Regeneration Bill, will hopefully become law sometime this year. It's taking quite a while going through Parliament, but it, it's getting there. Um, but one of the consequences of this is basically all existing planning guidance is going to have to be rewritten. Uh, the National Planning Policy Framework is the one that people are probably most fami familiar with, but there are several other types as well. Um, one of the problems we have with shared transport is in planning terms, um, to a large extent, it doesn't exist. Um, with mobility hubs in particular, uh, in policy uh, terms, while, while there's been um, warm statements and supportive uh, language in things like the transport decarbonisation plan, when it comes to actual uh, prescriptive policy, it just doesn't really exist. So there is the chance here, um, which is really probably a once in a generation um, chance in terms of planning, um, to actually significantly rewrite the, the um, planning rules as they exist, to focus them uh, in, in around transport more uh, and around a much more environmentally friendly approach towards transport. So those are the two um, uh, key bits I, I, I'd make. I think I'll, I won't give you any more slides. I don't know if I overwhelm you, um, but uh, leave it there in that respect. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, I think we'll jump straight to our fifth panellist. We're a bit constrained on time. Uh, Mark, you've still got your slot, by the way. So Thank you. So protecting your slot. Thanks. Um, Mark's head of uh, Future Transport at Transport West Midlands. Uh, Mark is responsible for uh, numerous technology and service delivery programmes. Um, he's recently led the Future Transport Zone program, which included elements such as mobility credits, mobility hubs, mobility as a service, and new modes like e-scooters and West Midlands on demand. Uh, separately, Mark, all, uh, Mark also oversees the Connected Thomas Vehicles and related infrastructure activities, as well as developing transport behaviour change program, including the DFT's new Influencing Transport Lab. Uh, Mark. There's clearly many new options becoming available to travellers, and we heard earlier with the, the earlier panellists about the increase in choice. What is the right balance uh, in improving tran the transport system and helping people make better choices? Yeah, thank, thank you. And there's a slide as well. There is indeed, yeah. So, yeah, I think, I suppose there's two key, two key takeaways I was just trying to get across as part of this session. The first being that, there's, a, there's an absolute requirement for innovation, engineering, analysis. All those tools are absolutely fundamental to understand where we're at and also where we need to get to. The reality of that is also that 
the path we're on is not going to get us to a place whereby we actually hit the targets we're also setting ourselves. And I think that's where sort of the other key point is. And, and this, this point is often forgotten, but actually is really crucial in that we need to understand behavior far more if we're going to have the goal or reach the goals that we, we set ourselves. And I think what's, what's interesting is, is this real reflection. In a lot of the conversation that we have internally with professionals, we are focusing in and around journey solutions. The problem is that the public at large have journey problems. And the, and the considerations that an individual has in terms of defining what their solution is, is not necessarily the same perspective that we have. There is a, there's a position that I would argue that many uh, colleagues have, which is we build it and they come. And the problem is those that are actually having the transport problem don't see it that same way. And there's lots of other, whether they be personal, environmental, sort of physical journey type issues that people are facing, which actually define their ability to take the journey. And for us, if we really want to find that right balance, we need to understand the journey problems at large in order to reflect the solutions which solve their problems and not the other way around. Mm -hmm. I think that's really a really, really key point. Um, and, and by focusing on those problems, actually we can be far more innovative. That might mean that the solutions that we come up with are not necessarily ones that we would prescribe as generalized transport, but actually they facilitate the requirements and they facilitate the, the availability for someone to take a solution which previously wasn't available to them. And that's really where the exciting bit around innovation comes for me, is trying to solve those journey problems for people. And I'll give you a little for instance, and apologies for anyone who works at National Express, because I've, I've sort of picked on a little bit here, but this is not intentional. What we've done on the left-hand side is really just try and break out all of the, the different angles and the different perspectives that an individual has or may reflect upon as part of their journey solution and considerations in, in making their choice. On the right-hand side, we have a, a relatively generic um, uh, avatar, advertisement from NX talking about taking some travel. But actually, if you start to drill down into this, you can actually see how the communication from that uh, advertisement isn't actually relating to the individual's problems at all. It's a one day of free bus travel. The question is, how can I use it? What problem does that solve to me? How can I correlate that one day of free travel to my problem, which is I've got three kids, I've got to get a prescription, I've got to go to the shops, et cetera. How does, how does that correlate to my problem? The other reflection here, which is interesting, is NX say, help us celebrate. Celebrate what? Why, why would I want to celebrate actually this clean air day? What does that mean to me? What problem is that solving for me? And again, this is narrative of we as a, as a transport body, we have a problem which is we need to get clean air. How does that correlate to an individual? How are we talking to the individual about clean air? Why is it important to them? Why do they need to get involved, etc.? And then we will have this other piece which is how do we make it easy and simple for people to take these alternative modes? Actually, the reflection on here is go to a website. Well, actually, if we go to the website and we do some more digging, if I've got three kids in the back of my car and I need to get somewhere, I'm not going to go to a website to find out more information about how to take the bus. So we're introducing barriers for people that make it harder for people to actually take that sustainable choice. And so again, it's really a case of how do we reflect on solving those problems for people? How do we make it barrier-free? How do we make it so it's easier for an individual to take an alternative which is sustainable than it is to get on the car and the drive? And that's really the, the key challenge in transport as I see it. Thank you, Mark. Um, you have, uh, the government strategy for behavioural change is less than clear sometimes. Uh, how can we really get into the transport user's psyche? Less carrot or stick and more hearts and minds to solve their problems and reduce emissions. Yeah, I've, I've sort of preempted that a little bit in the slides, I suppose. But I, I, I think for me, it's we're, as professionals, we're quite comfortable in the transport space. We understand the technology, we understand the data, we understand... You know, what, what it takes to implement sort of services, et cetera. The, the challenging bit for us is to correlate that and understand the user at the center of this. Um, not many people take the bus or the train just because it's fun and they like to take the bus or the train. The reality is they're taking those modes because they're transacting a journey. We need to understand what barriers exist, why they're doing that, what, what things are as part of that sort of dynamic of a challenge for them and the pain points uh, that exist for them to actually make that decision. Uh, and bearing in mind, 90% of all decisions that are all taken are unconscious. So actually, there's a, there's a real challenge in there in making something um, that is a, is a sort of a conscious um, difference to someone that actually they, they take note. Um, so I think there's some, there's some real interesting challenges in the psychology that we need to sort of get under the skin of uh, and, and follow sort of practice from, from outside of transport. 
Um, and I'm not suggesting that we become the next Google uh, or the next Meta, but, but effectively what they, they understand far more about us as individuals than, than we do in transport because actually our focuses are, are in a, a different place. So I think that for me, that, that's sort of where we've got to start is, is understanding people. Fantastic. Thanks, Mark. Well, we've had, a, we've had quite a lot of activity on the Slido. Um, I'm not going to be able to get to the questions, but I've got some themes that Renny's been putting together for us at the back there. A lot of, about, uh, a lot of the questions about ambition and how ambitious we need to be, considering the urgency of what we're, what we're against, um, and how the subnational transit bodies um, can raise or enable uh, higher levels of ambition, and also to do with game-changing policies at the end of the day, quantifiable carbon reduction, uh, which is in the LTP guidance coming out, is around traffic reduction. And um, a another theme around having an integrated set of planning tools that is for wider use, not just for the subnational transport bodies and their partners. So that's a, a point that's come through. And um, uh, prioritizing metrics. So you, you, a sort of theme coming through with some of the slider questions is around the data governance. Maybe we want to change the word governance to enabling good data and how we make sure that baseline is consistent across uh, without too many confusing metrics and making sure we get some sort of consistency going there. So those are the sort of things we've, he we've heard on Slido. Um, I'll talk to Meeting of Minds whether we can get back to people with a little bit more detail on some of the questions that are raised. But hopefully you, from the panellists you can hear about, we're talking about measuring it, how we can plan policies to reduce it. Don't forget about the whole carbon how we innovate to zero with new options, and how we make the preferred choice the, the easiest one for people to take. So I don't want to keep you from your lunch. And uh, so if you'd like to uh, just thank the panelists, please, we'll draw that to an end. <laughs>